let's uh, now just gather our thoughts and come before the Lord and ask him to be with us and for this to be a special time of worship to him, a time when we're not thinking about how we're connected, but we're thinking about who we're connected to. So Lord, I just ask, I ask that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit this morning, that you will enable us to operate the tools that we have before as well, and that you'll enable us, enable us to continue to be joined together in worship for you. Thank you for each person that's been able to join us this morning, wherever from. We thank you for this being possible. And we pray, Lord, that we will have a special time, a special time connecting with you, connecting together with you in your presence, wherever we are this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our first hymn this morning is a video, and um, I remember that this video, this one was chosen originally by Bob, and you can't see Bob at the moment uh, on the screen in the chapel, but uh, you might be able to see him uh, in, in a moment or two. But Bob chose this, and Bob, uh, we'll pray for Bob later, but Bob's in hospital in Northampton. He uh, has issues with his heart, um, and he was taken into hospital on Friday. It's not another heart attack. They think it's something, I think, with his stent. But anyway, Bob's, Bob's online and visible from the hospital bed in Northampton. So that's the amazing thing of that now, that someone in hospital can join. We can't go and visit him, but he can visit us. So um, <laughs> I stand amazed in the presence. If you could just hit play, Jan, and then we'll hit play.
So now Marilyn is going to come and read to us from these scriptures. Marilyn. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 to chapter 4 verse 1. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving, Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. My Jesus, my Saviour. We're going to sing uh, My Jesus, My Saviour in a moment or two, but Jan's just finding her, uh, her music. Just hold on a second, just so you know what's going on. Right, she's here now. Yeah, all fine. Got the cat's box open.
Sorry, there's a slight delay between what's happening down here and what's happening on the screen, isn't there? So uh, if you look at both at the same time, it might make you a bit travel sick. <laughs> but, um, okay, so Marilyn read to us from the pa passage in Colossians. And um, Paul starts uh, this little section, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of body, of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. He's talking about the whole attitude that we're to have as Christians, as believers in him, as, as people whose lives are set in him, where we've put our, our trust in him. As, as people in that position, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Some of the things that are said like this as, as very easy for us to say and sometimes difficult for us to do. Jesus says, do not worry. I don't know anybody who has succeeded in fully following that instruction. Do not worry. Yes, it's one of those things that whatever happens, the worry comes into, uh, into our minds sometimes, doesn't it? And I have to say, I'm, I'm learning to not worry. I'm, I'm getting better, but um, I've got a professional worrier that I live with. And, um, <laughs> and uh, if, if there's something to worry about, Jan will find it at, uh, at different times, won't you, dear? You don't mind me saying that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it just starts not to worry. As we start to prepare to come together, we were doing things differently this morning. It's difficult. You have to prepare and think about everything that you can do to be ready and then um, not worry and uh, put it in God's hands. Uh, sometimes easier said than done. But letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts involves setting down the anxieties that we have and actually saying, I'm going to trust God for whatever happens. I'm going to trust him and accept that he's in control. And whatever the outcome, and even if it doesn't go well and the way that I expect it, then I'm still going to trust him with the outcome. And Paul wrote this from the position of undergoing the most incredible persecution in his life. If anyone had got things that we might worry about, Paul was it. And yet he knew that peace in his heart. And he says, as members of one body, you are called to peace. I don't know about you, but uh, some of the things that can make me anxious is worrying about how other people are going to think about what I do. Yeah, sometimes I'm worrying about their opinions and are they going to be pleased? Yeah, that can make me anxious. Worry about how other people are going to react to things. If we need to talk about something, are they going to be upset about it? It can be easy to be anxious about those things. But we're reminded that we are called to peace as members of one body. We're to make it easy for people to talk to us honestly. You know, if, we, if someone needs to come to talk to us about something, do we react with hostility or do we react in a way that makes it easy for people to have that conversation? Um, somebody's not on mute. Let me just see if I can uh, resolve that. But, muted everybody okay um so it's uh, it, you know it's important that we we're, we're one body we're together there's to be a peace that's flowing among us and we're one body with members of other churches as well in uh, two weeks time we're having a joint service at the village hall with uh, with all saints and um it's really special and i think uh, many of us over lockdown when we had the online services there were a lot of people from both congregations together and others who weren't able to join in that way but there was a very real sense of being one body in in the village and uh, it's really important that we remember that we're one body of christ he doesn't have multiple bodies we may have different expressions of his body but we are one body and we're called to peace with one another so just uh, moving on so that's one of the principles from which paul is speaking at this time letting the peace of christ rule in our hearts and another principle that we see in this passage because it talks about lots of practical outworking but another principle is whatever you do work at it with all your heart as working for the lord not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. 
And uh, that's such a wonderful principle for our lives, and we're going to talk about some practical outworkings of that that Paul touches on. But the lives, whatever we're doing, do it as to the Lord. Whether we're sweeping the floor, whether we're doing the washing up, whether we're cooking a meal, whether we're um, whether we're working in the garden, whether we're working in a job that we really hate. Now, looking around, probably not too many of us have to do jobs that we really hate anymore. Most of us are retired. Uh, maybe there's still things we have to do that we really hate, but do we do it as worship to the Lord? I remember finding that a real challenge with some tasks that you have to do that are difficult. Can I do it in a way where my whole spirit is worshipping God? Thank you for this task that's in front of me. Thank you. I've got the opportunity to do this. I may, might not like it, but keep my heart in a place where I'm honouring you. And somehow the job becomes a joy. Because if the job is part of our worship to the Lord and the way we're doing it is part of our worship to the Lord, then it has a... It becomes a privilege to be doing it instead of something that's awesome. And why are we to have that attitude? Since we know that we will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. We have the promise of eternal life in him and things that we have to put up with. And this is Paul's attitude. And Paul living in great hardship, often in prison, we know shipwrecked, flogged, horrible things that happened to him. But he lived through that, looking to God, looking towards the prize at the end, saying, whatever I'm going through in this world, it's, it's nothing compared with the prize that is set before me. He encouraged people in other parts of, it, of, of his writings, he encouraged people to be like athletes, pressing on towards the finishing line. That that's what we're, how we are to live our lives. And it doesn't matter whether we're still at a time of life when we're working or at a time of life that we're retired. We still have this job to do as his followers. And so um, Paul then goes on. So I'd skip towards the end of the passage there just to draw out that principle that carries through all of the things that he talks about. He says, let the message of Christ dwell amongst you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And um, teaching and admonishing one another. Paul speaks about a body of people who relate to each other, a body of people who are in relationship and speak to one another and inspire one another. It can become the case in church sometimes that somebody is seen as being the person who does the teaching and admonishing and everybody else just comes along to be taught and uh, they always look at it in that way. But it's really important that there's a picture of a body and there's nobody who is above their lives being spoken into by other people in the body. I think it's a real challenge. If I'm ever at the place where I'm not prepared to let somebody else speak into my life, then I have no right to be standing up speaking into other people's lives. There has to be a mutuality. We're in a relationship, in, in a body together, not in a place where um, somebody is in uh, the position of doing all of, the, all of the instruction but never receiving instruction. Now, you know, some people have different gifts and if we have a gift of teaching, it's our, our job to do that and to expand scripture and so on but we can't do that in a place where we're not also accountable to one another and so I really believe that's important but Paul speaks here about with all wisdom through psalms hymns and songs from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and Jan and I we 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 very much um, have in our hearts a, a desire that sometimes in our worship there can be a spontaneity. We spent some time earlier before the service this morning just singing some hymns together, um, you know, from about 10 o'clock and praying and just seeing how the Holy Spirit led us. And there's something about that, of, of people being together and, and worshipping together and different people starting different things. And um, we've known times when worship has happened 
and songs have just flowed one after the other, been started by different people, and um, there's a real sense of the Holy Spirit just leading the whole congregation together, and that's something that, you know, I, I always long for in worship. We can't make it happen, but as we sort of grow in the life of the Holy Spirit, these things will happen. And again, in verse 17 there, Paul says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Again, the emphasis, whatever you're doing, whether in word or deed, do everything in Jesus' name. And if you're doing something that you can't do in Jesus' name because you, don't, you know it's something that Jesus wouldn't be doing, then the message is you shouldn't be doing it, isn't it? So if you can't do it in Jesus' name, don't be doing it. That's the, uh, the, the, the fundal message of that. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then Paul goes on to speak to these practical outworkings of these things. And he says... Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And in this context here, and uh, many people criticise Paul as a misogynist and, uh, and say all sorts of things about him in this respect. I don't think Paul was a misogynist. I think uh, he was a man operating in his culture. And I think when you see the things he wrote, he wrote about the way that Timothy's faith had been developed by his mother and grandmother. He recognised this incredible importance of the role of women, especially in bringing up families. And this was the most important thing that people could do. I don't think he was a misogynist. But certainly in the culture that he was in there was an expectation that um, wives obeyed their husbands um, now when i was uh, a young boy i was a, a choir boy in a local parish church and it was a parish church that was very popular for weddings um, quite remarkably i remember one summer saturday there were eight choral weddings uh, and um, the, as well as eight choral weddings there were four non-choral weddings as well so it was like a production line that while people were coming in one door the photographs from the previous wedding would be happening outside the other door in the churchyard i, I can't i I can still remember how grubby as a choir boy in a white surplus and white roof I felt at the end of eight weddings on a summer's day when you've been singing and standing out in the sun being photographed with the, with the wedding party and then traipsed back in again and back round for singing in the next wedding. It was uh, something of an occasion. But in every one of those weddings that I remember at that time, people always promised to love that the wife would love, honour and obey her husband. The, the husband promised to love and honour his wife, but the wife always prayed, promised to love, honour and obey her husband. Now, I know my mother was a, a fairly radical thinker, and when she got married, she very definitely didn't include that in the vows, and uh, the person who conducted their wedding was my, uh, was my father's brother. And um, he apparently teased my mum right up to the end that he was going to leave it in, <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't. And I have to say, my mum lived her life almost sticking to a vow of not obeying my father, if I was honest. <laughs> um, she was the most... Uh, she, if, if my dad wanted to do something, that would be the very best reason for my mum to want to do something else. But that was her character, and they lived for uh, nearly 60... Uh, over 60 years of marriage, uh, uh, bickering about everything, but they got on pretty well with it, uh, through, through it all. That was their relationship. But here, Paul isn't really making a point about the, the order of things. Even the rest that he's saying, what he's saying is, in that relationship, in those commitments you've made, do it, do it honourably. Don't mind the fact that you have to do it. You're doing it as to the Lord. I'm not sure. Lynn, there's somebody... Um, there's somebody talking. Do you think you could find them and mute them? There's a, a lot of clunking happening. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I can't unmute them. Um, it's the telephone, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. Sorry. Yeah. That's, that's no, a... no problem. No problem. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. So, so Paul is really saying this is honouring that when people undertake the commitments that they've made, 
do it and do it with joy do it as is fitting to the lord yeah and it's uh, and and you can see from the other things that he goes on to talk about that context he says husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them i know that's you know the the the, the husbands are to be gentle there's another place in in um, ephesians i think where paul says Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, giving yourself up for them. Well, that's the hardest verse in the Bible. How do I love my wife as Christ loves the church, giving myself up for her? Christ gave his life on a cross for the, um, for the church, yeah, for his church to be his bride. And I'm to love my wife with that same love. I know that I fall short of that, but that's the model that's set before us. So husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. He's speaking into a place where there will be peace in the community because people are actually operating in submission to one another, in honour of one another and in care of one another. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. That's a a challenge sometimes. It can be very easy as a father or a mother to get really upset with your children about things and to set expectations for them that they resent. And if you leave your children in a place where you've put burdens on them that they resent, then it tends not to encourage them. You may be trying to bring them up in the right way and encourage them to do the right things. But things can move from being encouragement that helps to being a burden that you've placed on somebody that they resent and at that point they're totally discouraged from doing following that route and they'll do anything but follow that route i know when we were bringing up our children we once they were past sort of being very small and uh, had come to a place of having some faith of their own we felt it was really important that we had to let that be expressed in different ways and ken our oldest son when he was um, how old chap he was about 11 he was playing wanted to play football on a sunday morning and not come to church with us and we were sort of a bit challenged by this and we said okay well he's old enough he's come to a place where he definitely has his own faith and this is his decision and so we said okay we'll drop you off um, we were going to a church in rugby at the time we'll drop you off at quick colts and pick you up again afterwards and we did that and um after two or three weeks he said Oh, I really miss coming to church yeah. and, um, and came back and that was the end of it. He never thought about playing sport on a Sunday ever again. And you think, you know, I know that could have worked in, in lots of different ways, but it was really important. It just felt like he was old enough to make that decision and it was, uh, he knew it, he understood it. It wasn't um, something that he was naive about. And that we said, no, you've got to come to church. Then church becomes something that's a legalistic expectation, not actually something that he enjoys. And um, it was really important that for him, coming to church was, he, he came, he, came because he wanted to be in church with the people in church worshiping god in church and um, as i say from then on i think uh, church remained as part of his life paul then goes on to say something that might be even more difficult for us to understand slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the lord Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Um, Some say that when you think about slaves in the Hebrew culture, that slaves were in some ways more like bonded servants. They were, uh, there was a a different relationship between a master and slave at that time than what we think about when we think about the uh, slave trade and uh, and so on in the plantations uh, and the horrific things that have happened um, to, to people enslaved by the European nations sort of three or four hundred years ago. But the point that Paul is making, these are the circumstances in which you are living your life and live that out as, as worship to God. Do what it is that's being asked of you willingly. Don't just do it when somebody's watching at you in order to curry favour. Do it well. Do it as well as you possibly can because it's part of your worship, but with sincerity of heart 
and reverence for the Lord. I know that in um, um, it, it, there are times when uh, maybe I want to eat something that I shouldn't eat, and I, I take a look and think, "Is Jan watching?" <laughs> and um, and uh, I can get away with it, you know. And there's a sense of I know that if I'm going to um, um, maintain the appropriate body condition, it has to be something that I embrace with my heart and uh, and choose whether I'm what I'm going to do, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to exercise uh, as a matter of principle, not uh, and uh, look because this is part again part of my worship to God, not as a question of is anybody looking? Yeah, um, you know the calories still count whether anybody's watching or not. So. Uh, there's a sense in which we are, whatever we do, to live out our working lives with this attitude that everything we do is with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. And again, back to that verse that we looked at, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Isn't that an incredible challenge? And then verse 25 Anyone who does wrongs will be repaid for their wrongs. And there is no favouritism. We are, we have a God who sees everything, knows our heart. And when we give our hearts to him, he enables us to live our lives in a way that's honouring to him. And then in the first part of the next chapter, it seems to me that the chapter division is in quite the wrong place uh, in Colossians at this point. They weren't in the original text. The chapters were put in later. He says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So if you're a servant, you have to be a good servant. If you're a master, you have to be a good master. And that in the fellowship of believers, there are going to be both masters and servants, and those relationships are there. But each one is to carry out their part in a way that is loving and honouring and respectful. And so our Christian lives should inform everything that we do, whatever it is that we're doing, whether it's um, something in the community, whether it's things in our families, whether it's things in our paid employment, that everything we do, we do as worship to the Lord. And if that's the case, if there's ever a time when we're struggling to do that, then we need to ask him, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, come among us, come to me, Lord, and help me to do this in a way that is honouring to you. I know in my, um, in my working life, I worked for a big American company, and uh, there were times when I had to do things that I didn't particularly want to do with the people that, I, uh, that worked for me. Yeah? And there were times when you had to implement things and implement policy changes, and you have to accept that you're paid by the company, and people at um, the most senior levels have decided this is a time when we're going to reduce this number of headcount, or we're going to do this, that, or the other. And you can't sit there and say, well, I'm not going to implement that. That's, uh, that's what you're being paid to do. But you can do it in a way which is straightforward and honest and be as absolutely open and straightforward with everyone involved as you can be. And I found that in that, um, one gained enormous respect from the people that you work with and uh, because they would know that if you were telling them something, you were telling them in a straightforward way uh, and, uh, and were interested and concerned about them as people. So... Our Christian faith is to inform absolutely everything that we do and inspire absolutely everything that we do. And God is interested in everything that we do and in walking with us in everything that we do. Let's just pray a moment. Lord, I thank you that by your Holy Spirit we can live lives that are pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray that you will help us in everything that we do this week. That your Holy Spirit would be with us. And you will keep our thoughts and our actions sweet before you. That everything would be with love and respect for the people that we're dealing with. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now... We're doing this because we have a great hope. We're going to sing in Christ alone. 
I think you forgot to put the capo on last time, Jim. Oh, <laughs> so you were in a different key. You were in a different key, that's right. Is everybody warm then? Because we can just pop the heaters on. And I do want to put on heaters. Well, they're keeping you open, aren't they? Because the dryers are on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they come to our notices. I apologise for that flicking. I'd managed to get a slide slightly out of order. So back uh, to the thing. So for our notices. So we've got no Bible study this week. We're taking a break until September with the Bible study. Next Sunday again, we've got um, family service at 10 and our normal service at 11 here in the chapel and on Zoom. Um, after next week, we'll be reverting to our normal time of 10.45 for, the, uh, for, for our normal service. So it'll be 10.45 from September onwards. Um, September the 5th, we've got a joint service with all saints at Yelvertop Village Hall. That's going to be at 11.15, which is the normal starting time for the All Saints service and gives people a chance to get there, having done things in quick and uh, other things first. So that's at 11.15 at the Village Hall. We're hoping it'll be outside where we can kind of sing with unbridled enthusiasm. But if the weather is, doesn't allow that, then it'll be inside at the Village Hall. So um, that's on the 5th of September. Want to just uh, acknowledge Lynn uh, this morning, Lynn, Lynn Nichols. She did the 5K. Uh, yeah, sorry, indeed, Lynn Pook. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn Pook, <laughs> um, who did the race for life yesterday. Yes, yeah, so um, Lynn, uh, as most of you will know, has been for the last um, five years undergoing some. A very significant cancer treatment and um, it has to be said um, she's been pressed on with amazing fortitude and this 5k war was it's raising uh, funds for cancer research so really well done Lynn we really appreciate that and sorry for even suggesting you'd walk 5k <laughs> Lynn <Nagel. laughs> um, but but while we're on congratulating Lynn's um, Lynn Nichols over on my right hand side here, she was uh, basically instituted into her new role as centre manager for CAP in Rugby. CAP is Christians Against Poverty, which is a wonderful charity that helps people find their way out of, out of debt basically. And you look at the problem of this country, of so many people are buried in debt that they can't manage and it's not it's not a question of providing them with money and paying off their debts. It's about finding uh, and finding ways to help them with a strategy and actually sometimes interfacing with lending organisations to negotiate on their behalf to find a way for them to be free from debt. And it's a Christian charity. And, you know, the wonderful thing is that we live in a situation where we all have a debt that we can't pay. We all have a debt that we can't pay because none of us can live lives that are up to the standards of our Lord. And he's paid the debt for us. He's paid the debt for us and we're free from that debt because he paid for it on the cross. And so it's really, really good that Lynn's involved in helping people, so many people, um, find a way out of debt. So, uh, this morning. We're going to pray uh, now. Um, Let's start. Uh, it's lovely to have Bob with us. Um, it's lovely to have Bob with us this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, let's pray for Bob to start with as he's in hospital. Lord, I thank you for Bob. I thank you for the way that you've kept him going through different heart attacks and. Uh, and so many different things and I thank you that he's still with us and able to worship I thank you for his music and for other things Lord and I pray that you will be with him now and you'll be with those who are treating him and you will enable him to return to his normal life quite soon we ask this in Jesus name Amen Somebody else who isn't with us this morning is um, Steve. Steve normally joins us from Spain. They're in the process of um, we're, they're in the process of of uh, moving house at the moment and ha had invited people to come and pick up furniture. So they weren't able to join us this morning. But um, Steve asked if I would share a prayer that he's written, and so I'm speaking this prayer as Steve. Dear Father, please help me to have the strength to be able to deal with all the terrible news we hear each day from Afghanistan 
and other areas of conflict. At times the news is overwhelming and hard to take in. It can leave me feeling quite depressed. Whilst we are living our normal day-to-day -day lives, thousands, no millions of people are suffering the most awful situations. And if we believe all we hear, then things will get worse before they get better. There are moments when I can feel so guilty about enjoying everyday things. A nice meal, watching sport, enjoying a walk, playing golf or just living my life. I know I can do very little, in fact nothing, to help practically. Please hear my prayers for these people. The suffering they endure is at times too much for me to bear or understand. Father, please be with these people and with those who make decisions to enable your compassion to shine through on this catastrophic situation. I'm sure Steve echoes many of our thoughts as we think about the situation in Afghanistan and perhaps we can take a moment silently, each of us, to lift that country before the Lord. the cursor down key and I used to lose focus on my cap on the other one. Page down. Now, as we think about things closer to home, I'm very sorry about that, uh, the slight technical glitch here. As we think about things closer to home, pray for a young lady in the village who's undergoing trans uh, cancer treatment. She doesn't actually live in the village anymore, but her family do. So, Lord, we lift her before you. For Heather's brothers, both undergoing cancer treatment for throat and tongue cancer. For Sue, following the loss of her husband, Dave. Lord, we continue to lift Anne and Lynn and Charlie and David and Jill and Dennis before you, Lord, and pray that your hand will be upon them and they will know your presence with them in every moment of their lives. So now let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we come to our last hymn, which is In Christ Alone, which again, we're going to have from a video. So that's In Christ Alone. No, we haven't. Sorry, we've done In Christ Alone. It isn't In Christ Alone. It's the other hymn, which again is... Um, just a closer walk with thee, I'm very sorry, just a closer walk with thee, which is um, something that Bob's recorded for us uh, some months back. Um... <laughs>
Jesus is my belief. 